a virtual welcome to all the guests and customers that have made it uh, today to be able to join us in this session that we are running. This is part of our um, uh, training and capacity building for our customers to in line with our values and in line with our aspiration to enrich lives through financial empowerment. So allow me at this point also before I engage further to introduce um, the panelists who will be uh, taking us through this topic. Uh, I think, I believe Regina is on, on call. Regina, if you could just say hello. Regina, could you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, yes, we hello, have say hello. I'm sure there will be a session later. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. Yes, and I look forward to a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Uh, Ronald, has, has Ronald managed to join? If you can hear me. Okay, if you can't, then uh, uh, subsequently you'll be able to uh, to do so. Now, before uh, we get into the session around um, the actual session around taxes, I would like to just take a brief moment to tell you a little bit about ourselves um, with HF um, and what it is that um, we uh, stand for. Um, first of all, from uh, a group perspective, uh, we are four entities and one group. So the subsidiaries of HF Group are HFC, the banking subsidiary, the one that um, is organizing this forum today. Then we do have uh, HFDI. HFDI, some of you knew it as a Kenya Building Society before, it used to be the property development company. Today, they provide more of advisory services and land owner developer solutions. Then we have HFBI, the bank, uh, HF Bank Assurance Intermediary, and HF Foundation. Um, those are the entities within the group, and we work very collaboratively. So if any need around the property side, the banking side, the insurance side, uh, we should be able to solve for that. Um, in terms of our ownership structure, uh, HF Group is owned 44% uh, by the members of the public and 48% by Britain. Uh, if you, if you, Chris, if we just move to the next one. Uh, yes, that's our shareholding profile. 48% uh, of, the, of the group is owned by Britain, uh, that blue pillar there. 44% uh, by members of the public, 5.34% by NSSF, and 2.41% by Government of Kenya. We are a publicly listed entity. Uh, we are listed on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. So anyone can actually own a part of HF by uh, buying directly on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. Uh, Britam itself is also a publicly listed entity owned by a number of shareholders, public shareholders, as well as uh, a number of private equity firms. In terms of what we offer, um, some, some people knew us as a property company, uh, but we are now a full service bank and uh, organized around personal banking, business banking, who is the organizer of this forum, uh, commercial banking, um, uh, treasury and uh, many other business lines. I would like us to just touch base around our foundation. Uh, as you know, if a house or a structure doesn't have firm foundations, then uh, it's not very solid. Our purpose, our purpose is enriching lives. Uh, we take that very seriously. In fact, part of what we are doing today is in line with our purpose of enriching lives. Um, please just go back to the earlier slide. Uh, enriching lives 
through financial empowerment. So we hope that at the end of this session, uh, each of the participants would have taken something home around how their life would be enriched. And please reach out to us on the Q&A or on the chat in terms of how we can make your life also better. Um, we do have a vision. Uh, our vision is to be a top 10 in 10 banking group uh, by being the most loved and dependable financial institution. Uh, and we have a whole set of values. Uh, we use the acronym STICKY, uh, stewardship, uh, teamwork, being innovative, customer centricity, and uh, integrity. Um, so we are very strong around that. And uh, we believe that in a, all manner of ways that we will be reaching out to yourselves and you engaging with us, we hope to have enriched your life at the end of this session as well. Um, we have a whole service offering. That offering, uh, which Krishna, you can move to the next slide. I think there's a little bit of a delay uh, when the slides are moving, but just bear with us. Um, so we, we do offer a whole sort, sort, sort of uh, service offering across the three, four segments that I had spoken about earlier. Our personal banking segment, our business banking segment, our commercial banking segment, underpinned by treasury, trade finance, uh, and a number of other supporting enabling functions. But across the business profile and the product profile, we can give you uh, business loans, we can give you personal loans, we can give you trade finance options. Uh, we can also give you treasury and, uh, and uh, foreign exchange solutions. And we, above all, we pride ourselves in providing advisory services, uh, which, for which one of these is what we are doing today, as well as business networking opportunities. Uh, if you would move to the next slide, Chris, if you don't mind. So, uh, Tim, we want to spend a little bit of time, uh, not necessarily just grappling around ourselves and um, and uh, bragging about what we do, but really delving into this area of taxation, because uh, I think there's a very famous saying that um, the only two things that are certain in life, either taxes or debt. Um, so, this session is not about tax avoidance, uh, I mean tax evasion, because we all have to pay taxes in some way. So we hope that at the end of this session, you'll be enlightened, particularly around the topic or issues um, that touch on the finance bill, which is a, an ongoing conversation, and uh, issues around affordable housing levy, uh, so that you understand, and issues around ETIMS and registration of, for ETIMS, what it means for you, uh, so the panel that we have put together today is very knowledgeable and informed in those areas, and we look forward to your engagement and further. And so any questions that you have, please do address them on the chat or use the Q&A function, and we'll endeavor to address all those. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Chris. Thank you, Peter, uh, for that uh, brief on who we are and what we intend to do. Um, our next program now, I'd want to invite our moderator, and that is our head of business banking, Anna Amasinde, who will then take off from here and introduce our panelists. So welcome, Anna. Uh, thank you, Chris, and good morning, uh, participants. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, webinar. Our conversation today will be revolving around tax matters. Uh, our webinar topic today is uh, tax measures for building sustainable businesses. 
and we'll have be having this conversation uh, with our esteemed uh, panelists. So I'd like to introduce them and welcome them today. Uh, with us, we have uh, Dr. Regina Kingori. I'll give them a session to just introduce themselves. Tell us a bit about themselves and what they do. So Regina, you can start us off. Uh, then I will have the other panelists also do the same. Uh, we have about three panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Regina Kingori, then we have uh, Ronald Borsi, and we have our, our director and business at HFC. So we'll have uh, Dr. Regina Kingori start us off by telling us about who she is and what she does and why today she feels that she's the best person for this conversation. Dr. Regina Karigusana. Thank you so much, Anna. I feel so humbled to be part of the panelists and to be together with you. And I'm so excited with this conversation and I'm so happy. So my name is uh, Dr. Regina Kimori. I'm a tax consultant and I run an audit firm. So the audit firm is called RWK and Associates. We are situated in Nairobi Westlands and uh, Thika. And uh, we offer audit, tax, and advisory services. Uh, when we talk about tax training, this is tax training is something that I'm so passionate about. I've done this for the last over five years doing tax training. And uh, I'm the best person because I interact so many so so much with business people. Uh, in training them uh, on taxation and helping them make decisions, good decisions when it comes to their businesses. I always feel when you understand about taxation, you're able to make good business decisions to ensure continuity of your business. So I'm so happy to be here. I hope you can see me well and then internet is okay. So thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tari. Yes, we can see you very well. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, we'd like to introduce um, Ronald Bossi. Uh, Ronald Bossi is the current ma group uh, managing partner at Ronald NLP. Ronald, welcome. Please uh, tell us about yourself and what uh, Ronald NLP is all about. Thank you, uh, Anna, for that introduction. My name is Ronald Bossi. I'm the group partner of Ronald's Africa. Uh, we are an audit, tax, and advisory firm. Uh, we are a pan African firm. We support organizations' growth uh, and help uh, businesses to be professional in terms of professionalization. At the same time, advisory on sustainability. Yeah, so we've been around for 14 years. Uh, we serve uh, organizations and companies operating across this African region. So we have an office in Nairobi, in Uganda. Uh, in Rwanda and Tanzania, but also through our global partners, Alinea Global, we serve uh, a number of companies across the African continent. So for entities that are looking forward to scale and require uh, somebody to work with them in terms of strategy, compliance, um, issues to do with the um, uh, leadership development and all that, so we are the best suited firm uh, uh, to partner with you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doctor. I have I'm just promoted you to a doctor. Thank you, Brother yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. We we'll now welcome uh, Patrick Junge. Uh, Patrick Junge is the current director retail and business banking at HFC. Uh, and we'll welcome Patrick to say um, a bit about what he does at HFC. Uh, then we can proceed with the conversation uh, of the day. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you, uh, Anna. I hope I am sufficiently audible. Uh, and thank you to the uh, many uh, customers and uh, would-be customers of HFC who have joined this call. As I have been introduced, my name is Patrick Chunge. I take care of retail and business banking uh, in the banking subsidiary of HF Group, which is HFC. Uh, uh, our bank MD has highlighted what we know my what we do uh, as an institution and uh, what we stand for. 
Um, I think what I can say by way of introduction is just to highlight what does this session mean to you and how will success look like? Uh, so um, as, as I was saying earlier, the only thing, one of the things that is certain in life is taxes. Uh, and uh, uh, looking at how taxes have become a part of life and how the public is better informed compared to years in the past, uh, the question is how do we navigate this? Uh, and hopefully by the end of this session, you will see HFC as your dependable partner to navigate uh, changes in, in, in the environment, such as those uh, brought about by, uh, by these tax uh, proposals that uh, are currently in the public domain and also being debated in parliament. Uh, thank you and Anna, back to you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so maybe uh, we didn't see speak. Maybe we can put on the video so that uh, the audience and the participants can be able to have a view of who's speaking. Uh, but I'm sure we'll have that session. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to ha be having this conversation today in regards to tax measures to build your business. Our focus today is on the businesses, and the talk the context today is uh, what is currently happening. Uh, in 2023, uh, we had the Tax uh, Act, uh, 2020 Finance Tax Act that was passed. Um, and uh, most of us as businesses are actually feeling the effect uh, in 2024. And therefore, part of the conversation we want to have today is to just demystify what is the Finance Act and what topic on the side is the Finance Bill 2024. Most of us just hear what is happening in the newspapers, uh, in the in the television, what has been discussed. But as a business person, I would like to know uh, what is this conversation all about? How does it impact my business? And how can I, uh, with the knowledge that I have, make sure that the business that I have continues staying afloat? The current medium term uh, revenue strategy for the government for the next three years is actually to increase uh, taxation from 14.1% of the GDP. 20% and therefore is in one way or another the discussion. So with us, I'd like to invite uh, Ronald. Ronald, please tell us, just give us, um, unpack for us, what is this uh, Finance Act of 2023? What does it, what does it, um, what does it mean? And, and to me as a business person, uh, how does it impact me? So Ronald, Karibu Sana. Thank you, Anne. I hope that you can hear me clearly because I know if you have any challenge, I think you can always just tell me because I'm operating uh, out of my usual place, my office. Uh, I'm in Ibasha here and I really appreciate for your invitation for me to speak through the uh, tax, uh, recent tax matters that affect uh, businesses, individuals and our country and, they, and sometimes uh, may disrupt our way of life. Yeah, so maybe just to begin with, uh, I would want to... Ronald, you're very audible, but if you could put the video on, if that's okay. Are you in a position to do that? The video is on, so I don't know why you're not seeing. My video is on. Oh, it is on? Yeah. Okay, just proceed then. Please. You can see? No, I can't see you. How is it? Because I'm it's on. I don't know either. Regina, can you see me? I don't know if I'm the only one. Regina, are you able to see Ronald? Any other panelist? No, 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 we can't see him. Ah, okay. I don't know what is the problem with my camera because it's, uh, I've switched on the uh, on and off. Just continue. We will, I'm sure we'll figure it out as we go along. Thank you. So, um, so uh, I just want to speak about the Finance Act. So Finance Act um, have uh, the every year the government uh, prepares a finance bill, and um, there is the finance bill alongside the budget. The budget it's what the government wants to spend uh, in a financial year uh, based on the revenue that the government collects from different sources, um, and uh, one of the major sources of revenue for the government is the is the taxes. So the budget is always prepared alongside the finance bill. 
Uh, so the finance bill provides for the ways and means the government is using in order to collect a revenue that will finance the budget. So the finance bill has to go through parliament through various discussions uh, and then members uh, vote and pass it. And thereafter, uh, there is always uh, the presidential uh, assent to the finance bill and it becomes a finance act. So once the president signs <clears throat> the finance bill from the parliament, it becomes a, a finance act. And there, there has been a very important um, aspect of a, a finance bill, which is public participation. And uh, I know now most of us are familiar with the public participation whereby government collects views on the proposed uh, tax measures uh, that are going to be used in order to enhance government revenue. And um, for now, uh, one of the best things that has happened to our country is most people have become aware of these laws and everybody has become more knowledgeable in terms of the lawmaking process and uh, the, just before i proceed into the some of the finance bill pro, uh, proposals that has been uh, passed in the recent past uh, is uh, also to discuss about taxation and uh, just maybe if you are um, a lay person if you're not uh, an accountant just to inform you about how our tax system operates so the kenyan tax system is divided into two we have what we call the direct taxes and the indirect taxes so the direct taxes are the taxes that are, 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 are charged directly to the individuals or, or corporations. You feel it. And uh, some of the types of the direct taxes we have is the income tax, um, and mostly the income tax on companies is what you call the corporation tax. And the, currently, our corporation tax is 30% for resident companies. Uh, for many years, the, we had 30% uh, uh, for resident companies and 37.5% for non-resident companies, but through the previous financial finance act, it amended that and brought all the taxation to be at uh, 30%. So if you're a company, assuming that you have a revenue of uh, uh, 10 million shillings and you have expenses of uh, 5 million shillings, uh, the profit of 5 million shillings is taxed at 30%. Uh, which is uh, uh, about 1.5 million shillings, which you pay to the Commissioner uh, of Domestic Taxes. So corporation tax is 30% of the profitability of a company. But then for individuals, um, the tax is charged on a graduated scale. The maximum scale we have now is 32.5%. Um, uh, uh, so that now for the, for those who have higher revenue, they will be charged at 32.5%. and uh, we have a graduated scale, uh, of course, beginning from 10% uh, there. So, and I know last year they amended, we had about 30% about uh, the highest tax band, and now they have improved it to um, uh, to about 32.5%, and then eight, over 800,000, 35%, which is a bit also very high for those high level, high earning individuals. So that is what we call the direct taxes. Other direct taxes that we have is, um, we have things like withholding taxes. For instance, if you are supplying, especially with regards to income taxes, if you have shares in a company and you earn dividends, uh, like what the MD of um, HF Group has said, that you can buy shares in HF Bank. So if HF Group pays you dividends, and then there is a withholding tax of 5%, Ronald, are you with us? Ronald, I think you've gone silent. Ronald, uh, I'm not sure. I, I can't hear Ronald. Is it back? Yes, now it's back. Yeah, sorry. Uh... I need to get a backup on my phone. So the the money you invest in the money market fund, if you get interest income, and then now that interest is also subject to withholding tax. That is a direct tax. Uh, then now the indirect tax uh, that we have is what you call the, the, we have some of the indirect taxes, things like VAT, which is at 16%. Uh, but for most of the jurisdictions in East Africa now, the VAT is around 18%. 
and uh, we hope and um, pray that uh, KRA will not one day wake up and increase the VAT to 18%, like in um, Uganda and uh, in Tanzania, uh, Rwanda, the VAT is 18, 18%, which is a bit high. Uh, but in Kenya, we are still at 16%, um, uh, something that is also positive. Actually, Rwanda, last time I, I had a conversation with the Revenue Authority, VAT is there one of the highest revenue uh, generation for those companies. And, and the reason why VAT has become very popular uh, in some of those countries is now the issue of um, automating uh, the tax system. There's been a global trend whereby revenue authorities are introducing um, online platforms whereby they're able to track sales for different companies. And then now you're able to track purchases and all that so that there is no much cheating. Very little room is left for cheating when it comes to collection of these um, indirect taxes like VAT. Uh, so in Uganda, we've seen them implement the IFRI system, uh, which also is working um, very perfectly. And Rwanda, they automated their VAT system uh, uh, sometimes back, they are ahead of us. Uh, so we are the laggers when it comes to now these ETIMs. Um, of course, um, uh, uh, the government has been very deliberate in implementing, and they look forward to increasing the collection of VAT but when there is fully implementation of the items, it's the items is so disruptive because then all your invoices are tracked with KRA, and then all your purchases that you made are also automated, uh, and uh, they kind of reflect on the revenue system. So you cannot now um, introduce new purchases that have not gone through the items, and then now the VAT is auto calculated. Uh, and of course, there's been a debate now in the in the tax uh, um, uh, 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 conversations that the because in for a long time kra has or, or in kenya we have operated what you call a self-assessment system but the introduction of the e-teams um is signaling uh, the whereby now kra will have to assess for themselves how much tax you are supposed to pay then you have an obligation to pay so those are some of the e-teams is really going to disrupt how vat is assessed and collect and most probably, if fully implemented, the government um, is projecting to increase the collection of VAT and also uh, the corporation tax. Because once again, your income has been captured uh, through ETIMs, your expenses have been auto captured also by your various suppliers. And then there will be an auto computation of the VAT uh, and the, the corporation tax. So again, you have a very little room to manipulate the books and all that. So again, these changes are saying that, um, that with the introduction of ETIMs, uh, it's signaling the end of um, uh, having two books, uh, one for KRA, another one for the banks, for loans, another one is for tenders, uh, because these systems are going to make it very um, tight. Uh, I normally joke with some of my clients that a um, that couple of years ago, it will be difficult uh to KRA to determine how much taxes you are supposed to pay because purchases you will only you can always pick purchases from anywhere and book them but then now with the introduction of items it's difficult to fake purchases difficult to fake revenue and all that so for most of the uh, companies and businesses the best uh, thing will be how do they get a proper tax advice and comply uh, um, uh, to, to come and comply to reduce the exposures. Uh, the new age is signaling that companies that are heavily compliant are going to have a competitive age. Because again, if you're non-compliant, you may not have a competitive age because you are at a risk of shutdown. Uh, of course, you might be isolated by companies, suppliers, uh, customers because you are non-tax compliant. So again, for the participants who are here, I, one of the things that uh, I can say that if you're looking forward to comply and comply uh, at least at a high level of percentage, and then you might also be developing a competitive edge that might keep you ahead of your competitors. Yeah, so ETIMS is, um, uh, is here with us and leaving very little room for manipulation of the record. The other indirect taxes that we have is customs. Uh, mostly to regulate imports, uh, to make sure that we are not um, really an import um, uh, country, we are also exporting, and also to actually protect the local market. Customs taxes is normally used to protect the local market. 
uh, from um, uh, cheap imports and all that. And we've seen that even in this tax laws, uh, KRA has really played around on customs um, uh, and also uh, increased some of the rates. They have, incre they have increased what you call the uh, import declaration levy uh, to 3% again, trying to regulate the, the imports that we are having uh, in this country. And then another uh, indirect tax that we have is, is what you call the excise duty. Excise duty has been termed by many people is what we call the sin tax, mostly to regulate also behavior uh, in a certain um, tax uh, jurisdiction. So we've seen like alcohol, cigarettes, uh, every year there's always um, tax increases. We have seen tax increase on betting uh, so that people are not unnecessarily uh, addicted to bad behaviors of betting, alcoholism, and uh, uh, smoking and all that. So excise duty has been used most openly to try to discourage uh, bad behaviors, which sometimes has been termed as sin tax. And in this finance bill, some of the things that uh, the, the, the Treasury has done and the government has done that are, has been shocking is uh, now increasing excise duty on bank transaction fees. Of course, eventually after public pressure and um, through public participation and somehow demos, uh, the government uh, revisited the issue of excise duty on uh, uh, bank processing fees, which was increasing from 15% to 20%. Notably, last year, we were at 20%, uh, uh, especially from the 2022 Finance Act. It had amended excess duty on bank processing fees from 15% uh, to 20%. Uh, a lot of public outcry and through public participation, they revised it to 15%. Uh, again, this year, the finance bill was, uh, was proposing to put it at 20%. It just shows you the desperateness, the uncertainty that characterizes uh, uh, taxes and how the tax... Uh, uh, making process is very volatile in this, this country and sometimes very unpredicted for investors and business people because putting it 20%, then 15%, then 15%, then 20%, um, there's a lot of confusion, especially within the uh, treasury in terms of uh, raising taxes and makes the environment very uncertain. So those are some of the taxes that we have, direct taxes and direct taxes. So when we come to some of the uh, various proposals uh, by Treasury through the finance bill of this year. Uh, one of the things that has had been proposed earlier is the motor vehicle tax of 2.5%. So the 2.5% has been deemed uh, fundamentally illegal because um, after you have understood the right direct taxes and direct taxes, where will motor vehicle tax uh, fa uh, fall? It doesn't fall anywhere any, in any of the categories because the indirect taxes we have the the VAT which is under the VAT Act. Uh, we have the Excise Duty Act. We have the the the, the customs. Uh, none of that has the motor vehicle levy of 2.5 percent, and of course also the direct taxes. And I believe that what led to a lot of um, uh, uh, pressure from the public and uh, discomfort is last year we had a similar uh, illegal tax, especially the housing levy that doesn't fall in any of the two categories. And there's been, there was public participation, people rejected. The government had proposed 3% uh, and a maximum of 5,000 shillings. And even after public participation and there was a finance bill, and uh, they, even it became worse because they reduced it to 1.5%. But again, they never put a capitation. So if you're earning uh, a million shillings, then 1.5% will be 15,000 shillings. And then from the employer, and then employee 15,000 shillings, that's a hoping 30,000 shillings. It is uh, not as I had earlier been proposed of 1.3% uh, and a maximum of 5,000 shillings. So I believe that kind of, I mean, you know, you remember how we have had a lot of uh, pressure from the government um, trying to um, bypass any uh, court rulings on the same and fighting and uh, its way to have that uh, housing levy sustained. And I believe this is what caused a lot of uh, uh, drama and uh, the recent demos that we have seen in town, because again, people could not just trust that after public participation, there will be amendments. So the government has developed some trust issues with the, with the, the taxpayers, and that's what led to uh, some of that pressure that we have seen. 
maybe before I talk about what you need to do as a business person and in, in order to manage your tax liabilities, some of the insights that I might have for you, I could also just run you through some of the the the, the taxes that were introduced. So one of the, especially through the finance bill uh, this year, uh, shortly. Yeah, so so we've I've talked about the 2.5 uh, levy that has been fought, and and then I think that is uh, what under the bridge now. We hope that it will not be reintroduced indirectly, and then the other issue is the repeal of the digital service tax. You know, this digital service tax is not very old. This digital service tax has been paid by those companies that are having digital um, uh, services, offer digital services, especially software licenses and uh, also some um, uh, digital. Um, uh, content and all that. So initially we had the 1.5% uh, for the companies and we saw um, we saw global companies, uh, especially in the digital space like Google, Amazon, Zoho and all that doing that, uh, really uh, rush to register so that they remain to, 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 to they still have a room to trade in this country. But again, we've seen this government saying that through this finance bill, they want to amend that, um, repeal that digital service tax and introduce another tax of 6% on significant economic presence. And one of the things I can say as an expert is that digital service tax mostly affected global companies in the digital space. But then now, I, I, don't, really, I, I don't understand why the government will repeal this and bring in the 6% on the profitability they make, because that is a very difficult I think to do for the government trying to go to those international companies and say they want six percent of the profit derived from Kenya. So what I can say that is like an indirect way of saying that uh, they will not have ability uh, to collect tax from them. And uh, you realize that when you talk about our, our funding partners like IMF and uh, the, the rest of the partners, uh, they are always uh, uh, supported by some of these global giants, uh, tech giants, and I suspect they have pushed the government to repeal that 1.5%. Of course, there was conversations earlier that the IMF had uh, protested uh, the digital service tax of 1.5%. So the government uh, actually yielding to pressure and bringing in the 6% on the issue of significant economic presence is something that uh, is uh, uh, really uh, uh, is not expected. Uh, the other issue uh, that is arising from this uh, finance bill is application of withholding tax on management fees. Initially, we have had management fees capped at 24,000. If you offer consultancy, uh, any management consultancy services, uh, or even contractual fees, they were all capped at a maximum, uh, a minimum of 24,000. Uh, so if you, it's anything below, there was no withholding tax of 5%. But now, this finance bill is repealing that. It's saying that we will tax, uh, have withholding tax on anybody, irrespective of the threshold of the amount. Even if you offer services at 10,000, 15,000 shillings, um, then you will have to pay 5% uh, or whatever tax uh, it is, whether you are a non resident or resident uh, company. Uh, so there, that is also something. The, the, what we see that, uh, you know, if I was uh, a business person and I'm paying somebody uh, 50 or 60,000 in a month, uh, most companies will break it into two. So they will say, well, let's pay 20,000 and 20,000, and then we don't pay the withholding tax. So this is try to um, manage that kind of uh, challenge that the KRA will have with the taxpayer that I've had with the taxpayers in the past. And then again, one of the, the biggest uh, introduction, one of the biggest uh, one of the most one of the most disruptive tax that is also this care the care is introducing through the treasury is the introduction of withholding tax on payments for goods supplied to public entities you know when you supply goods to the county it has always been that uh, you 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 are paid after a couple of days but the government is saying that now when you supply goods to counties you they withhold three percent if you are a resident company and five percent if you are an unrested company this is also yeah. some you know ronald yeah just hold on that thought yeah. um you you've you've widely uh captured a lot of um items on uh, value added tax on excess duty 
maybe out of curiosity, yeah. because I think one of the biggest conversations we had last year was on yeah. the housing levy. And I believe yeah. one of the things why we are having all this um, excitement uh, yeah. in regards to the finance bill for 2024 is yeah. because it has hit home. And uh, of course, the impact when it hits home, then you feel you need to get involved. And uh, I like also to just bring uh, Dr. Regina into the conversation. So when we when we talked about um, the Act of 2023, which I mean the bill, which is now the Act, uh, yeah. I think most of the implementation was done in 2024, and then the effect was actually being felt this year. Yeah. And therefore, it has created a, a lot of conversation. So maybe just to touch on that, and as I welcome uh, Dr. Regina into the conversation, this housing yeah. levy earlier was just for people who are employed. Uh, yeah. Now we have landlords who are going to be part of this conversation. And most of us as uh, landlords, we don't know how to go about it. So maybe just to bring that conversation to perspective, Dr. Regina and, uh, uh, um, and, and Bossi, uh, so that we take it home. Because uh, some of us, as businesses, we look at, as a small business, you look at uh, what is that one thing that hits me where it hurts? And if I can be able to know how best to navigate it. So uh, let's hear it out, Dr. Regina. Okay, thank you so much, Anna. I love the conversation with Ronald. Uh, he has really captured so, so many things, especially on the taxes that uh, the business people are supposed to do and a lot of conversation on the finance bill 2024. So for housing levy, I think uh, this was one of the biggest or the major issues uh, for the Finance Act 2023. And there were several other issues. We, If you remember, we also had the fuel which was also a very huge debate, uh, rising from the 8% to 16%. We also had the PSU and the introduction of the of the different, the 32.5%, 35%. But the housing levy, when it was first introduced, it was introduced to the employees or the people that was employed. Uh, for me, my thinking was, is because they were able to capture uh, the people very, very correctly. But now we have now the expectation that the landlords and also the small businesses, uh, the SMEs they are also supposed to do to, to remit the affordable housing levy. Uh, so the affordable housing levy for landlords, and if you remember, there was the, the going to the, to the courts Mostly they went because they had two major issues that they felt it did not follow the legal procedures and it was not inclusive. So the people that uh, were targeted were the employees. So the inclusion had to include everybody else and also follow the, the legal process for it to be effective, which they were able to follow. The other position is that they were supposed to offer exemptions which until now they were proposed. I was hoping that through the finance uh, bill 2024, we're going to have now the exemptions of the affordable housing levy, majorly being they had proposed those uh, changes that if you own a home, then you should you should be exempted from there. If you're older, uh, they had this stated that if you're 55 and above, you don't have to pay. So there were similar uh, exemptions. There were so many exemptions that they had uh, said, but of course they have to follow the legal processes for them to be effective. So for, for now, the affordable housing levy is being remitted by people who are employed, 1.5% of their salary and equivalent 1.5% is paid by the employer. When it comes to the affordable, to the to the landlords, they are supposed to do the 1.5% of the gross rent received. So remember these people, they also have the monthly rental income tax, which was reduced from 10% to 7.5%. Now they have to do the 7.5% and the 1.5%. The 1.5% of affordable housing levy is supposed to be filed by 9th. And, the, and the, the monthly rental income tax is supposed to be done by 20th. 
And I also foresee, I don't know how many of us own rentals here, is that this is also a, a, a way that we'll be, going to, we'll be doing a lot of audits. Because KRA will now come along and say, you've been doing your monthly rental income for the whole year, but you never paid the affordable housing levy. So they'll be coming back to, tack, to, to, to collect that money, of course, with penalties and interest. The other thing that I, I also saw this month when we were filing the, the, the rental income tax is that KRA is also demanding to know the location of the house. Where is the building? Where is the lock? Previously, we just input the details very, very plainly. But right now, for it to go through, they're asking for specification of the property, even where the property is located next to what. So I think they are just coming closer to closer to make sure that they are able to get the valid information and file. The other portion was that this affordable housing levy is supposed to be remitted by people who are doing turnover tax. Remember, the people who are supposed to do turnover tax are people who are very micro. You're doing one million turnover per year. So that is somebody who is doing very small kind of business. They are supposed to do, and, and there, was a, there was an amendment that was done in March because the, the turnover tax was at, at 3%. So it was increased by the Finance Act 2023 from 1% to 3%. But this year around March, there was a, an amendment that it was reduced from the 3% to 1.5% to accommodate the affordable housing levy at 1.5%. And these taxes are supposed to be filed separately. So for me, I think it brings a lot of compliance, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, work when you're supposed to be filing uh, different taxes at the same time. But what I foresee is that if you're doing the, the, the housing and you're not supposed and you, you're not doing the affordable housing levy, come next year you'll be required to be pay all the demands that you did not pay with penalties and interest. If you're doing turnover tax and you do not accommodate the affordable housing levy, you'll still be uh, demanded that money and it is on the gross rent paid or on the gross sales for turnover for the 1.5 percent so those are the other are the changes it's still uh very 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 punitive to understand and also to understand that after paying where do we where how, how what is the benefit of the person that is paying so i still think there are so many questions to answer around the affordable housing levy but for you as a business owner i think the first thing to do is to to protect your business by being compliant there are people who asked when the when the circular came in and they say that uh, you have to pay it uh, if you have a business there are people who are saying what about me uh, and I have employees and I'm paying. So the difference is if you have employees and you as a director, because they are, I know they are business people, you as the director, you are the first employee of that business. So you as a director, you're paying the affordable housing levy as an employee together with your employee. Then you can pay it at that particular point. For businesses now that they don't have employees, you can pay it together with when you're paying the turnover tax on your sales. So either way, every business in Kenya is supposed to pay the affordable housing levy. Anna, back to you. Uh, thank you, Regina. And I, I think you've answered uh, one of the questions I can see on the chat. The, uh, the question was, for landlords who are lim uh, limited liabilities with no employees, is housing levy payable? I think that one you've quite... Um, well, I elaborated it in terms of uh, what to pay. I think the other question on the housing levy then is, um, how do you um, how do you calculate it? Like you you said, um, if you're an employee, you 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 pay yourself a salary. 
some of us have very informal ways of running businesses. So do you create a pay slip? Uh, you start paying yourself a salary? Or uh, when you talk about turnovers, do I look at what I bank in the, in the, in the bank? Or do I look at my uh, investor deals? Um, how do I arrive at that, uh, at that tax measure? Because earlier on, uh, Bossi mentioned that uh, KRA has a say in determining the amount. So I don't know if for housing levy that is the case, or how do I go around it to make sure that uh, I don't get penalized in a way that will uh, hurt my business? Maybe you can speak to that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Anna. I, I is a very good question. So if you have employees uh, as a business owner, and you they have their salaries, you have a payroll. The basic salary. This basic is the the amount uh, plus the benefit, whether it's car allowance, bonuses, everything. That money is the money that is supposed to be chargeable for the 1.5% of the affordable housing levy. And the employer does the equivalent amount. Then through the bill, uh, through the bill, it's also stated that uh, it can it is an allowable deduction. So when you now come into the employee, and they are supposed to charge them pay as you, and you can you that amount that you pay for the affordable housing levy, you can uh, deduct it before now you come and calculate the pay as you and for the affordable housing levy for the company because there is also that cost that you're paying on behalf of this employee, it is an allowable deduction that it can be able to lower. It's an allowable uh, expense that you can lower the, uh, your, your profits so that you can lower the, the taxes. So for an employee, it is very easy to calculate it because you have the salary. And you as an, as an employer, and you also supposed to pay it, you're supposed to pay yourself a salary. Remember during audit, when KRA comes to do you audit, that is one of the first questions they check. Do you have director fees? Do you have um, salaries? Because you cannot operate a business as a director and you don't have a salary, you don't. So they will look at that and they're going to charge you for all the years. If you've never uh, taken that portion, they're going to charge you for all those years. The other portion that I've seen KRA very keen on is on directors with the draw. And I know some of us run businesses, not very professionally, that we are running mobile banking and you're using mobile banking to transact business. So you send money to your own m -Pesa. KRA can, is coming that with the draw as money you paid yourself. So they can also charge you, pay as you. And so it is very important as an employee, as an as a business owner, to offer yourself a, 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 a good salary. Know that you 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 you're saying that you pay yourself thirty thousand so that you pay lower taxes, and yet your lifestyle does not. Um, show that 30,000, it shows totally different. It is very, very important to just consider a good amount. When it comes to the affordable housing levy for landlords, it is the gross amount of rent received. So remember you're having a, a property that is, uh, you're, you're supposed to receive 250,000, but you receive 200 or you receive 100. Uh, the other people, there are people who are not there, they did not pay you some left. You're not chargeable to that amount that they did not. So this is the money that you received. So what you're supposed to do is a rent schedule that this money, this is how much money I received this month. And remember, KRA can do a confirmation through a bank account. They can request your banking. So if they request your banking and they see that that month you received 200, yet you claim that you received 100, they are going to charge the monthly rental income on that extra 100 and the affordable housing levy. So it is on the rent received that particular month and keep a rent schedule and that rent schedule should be together with the banking that this is the money that i actually received remember the gross you don't remove any expenses so if you have mortgage you don't 
uh, is not allowable. So it is a cross that you receive. If, even if you pay rent or service charge, you don't consider that portion. So sometimes I I, I tell people if you having a, a, a property and there are people are paying service charge uh, and others, you can do a separation and say uh, the rent amount is this much. The service charge and everything, let's put it somewhere differently so that you can be able to really not even pay. Some, some of those service charge are not even money that you, it's coming to your account. It's money that is going to the other service provider. So if it is not coming to you as a rent, you can do a separation and possibly you can talk about that later. So for the turnover tax for business owners now who are doing turnover tax, uh, or any other person who is doing VAT, but you don't have employees, but you have a business, you're supposed to pay the affordable housing levy on the gross sales. Remember, we are having ETIMS. ETIMS is giving Kari the information about the sales that you're doing every single day. So that amount that you're selling every day as a sale, not uh, not removing the, the, you don't allow or you don't remove the purchases, the, the gross sales, you do the 1.5% and pay the affordable housing levy. Back to you, Anna. Thank you, Regina, there's a question that I've seen posted. Would a landlord who has already paid affordable housing levy on a salary and elsewhere be still expected to pay affordable housing levy on rental income? Yes, because these are different entities and different uh, payments. So for them that they are employed, they pay the employer pays on their behalf and they also they are also remitted on their salary. On this house, this is a totally different engagement. The house also does the affordable housing levy. Otherwise, this these different transactions will be treated differently. Imagine if Kerry comes to audit that house, specific house, and I've told you this month, they are saying they want to know the house. They want to know the location, the, everything. So if they come to audit that, they will not consider that you are getting a salary somewhere and you're paying the affordable housing levy. Well noted. For land, for uh, someone is asking, is gratuity supposed to expose, be exposed to affordable housing levy? Gratuity. Yes. No. The affordable housing levy is on the basic salary, the salary that you receive on a monthly basis. Okay, so that means also the bonuses, anything else extra, that does not apply. Yes. No, uh, it does apply. So the, the, the salary is plus all those benefits. Salary plus any other benefit you get. So gratitude is yes. not considered a benefit. So gratitude, uh, my understanding is that uh, this is something that you're receiving at the end of your period of engagement or uh, at the end of the space where you're not working for that company anymore. So for that one, no, you don't pay the affordable housing levy on that. Okay. Uh, there's another question. For employers who are paying affordable housing for the employees and matching the amount every month, if the employer also has rental income, which they pay MRI every month, are they supposed to pay affordable housing levy also on the rental income? I've, I've, I've said the same with the other part, with the other uh, question. It is it is it is going to be treated differently. Okay, so so there, there the, has to be the, separation. The, the, yes, there has to be a separation. So you pay for your employees together with you when you're employed and you match, but also if you're having a rental property, the affordable housing levy also applies. Well noted. And what are the penalties for non-compliance uh, with the housing levy requirements? Either as a landlord or as an employer or um, 
uh, as a businessman who has employees. Okay, so at the moment, uh, it is stands at ten percent of the principal amount that I was su supposed to be have charged, plus penalties and interest, uh, plus interest because this is something that is going to be done on a monthly basis. So if Carrie comes to audit you in December, they have to calculate all the the period and then they give you the penalties plus the interest. So it is uh, at the 10% of the amount that was supposed to be have paid. So those are the penalties. Uh, thank you, Regina. Maybe this is to Ronald. Um, uh, you've unpacked very well in terms of uh, the finance bill 2024. Uh, people say the devil is in the details. What, what is this? Specific details we are not hearing in the newspaper. I mean, in the television, in the media. What is this detail that, as a businessman, I should be conscious of, and also try as much as possible to ensure compliance? Uh, Ronald. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Uh, some of the details that uh, I think has been overlooked in this finance act, in the finance bill, is uh, one. Care proposing that uh, the the treasury proposing that um, uh, they will be the ninety days period which you are supposed to they are supposed to respond to an objection. So the the practice is that when Care issues you an assessment, uh, you have thirty days to object, and then after that, uh, previously they had sixty days to give an objection decision, either to agree or disagree with your um, objection. And if they disagreed, then you can file an appeal for the taxes. Uh, so if they don't respond within 60 days, the law has been that your uh, objection is um, is taken to be the final um, taxes based on your objection. So now the, the finance bill is proposing to increase that period to 90 days. And one of the things that was very dangerous on that finance bill is that in 90 days, if you don't hear from them, then those taxes you are supposed to pay, uh, uh, you know, you're supposed to pay taxes, even if you don't hear from them after 90 days, if they don't give you an objection decision. That is very dangerous because then KRA, what will you be appealing um, against? So you will be appealing against their assessment. So that has not been given clarity, but I think that is very unfair. And because they're also giving taxpayers a very short time to appeal on um, an assessment of 30 days, but then giving themselves longer period of 90 days to give an objection decision, at the same time saying that if they don't give you that objection decision within 90 days, uh, then now the, the appeal um, is, 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 it seems to be, the, 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 the assessment seems to stand, which is a bit, uh, not uh, very favorable for most of the taxpayers. Then the other issue is that um, if you look at also the details, uh, there's a lot of tax VAT that has been uh, levied like on um, passenger uh, vehicles. If you like, for, if, for instance, if the assembly of passenger vehicles locally, it has been levied, in, in most of the time it has been, for, previously it has been exempt. Like for instance, if you're assembling uh, passenger vehicles, they have been exempt from VAT. So they are leaving 16% on the assembly and purchase of passenger motor vehicles. That is going to make the cost of traveling very expensive because you know very well, uh, if you are traveling, transport uh, travel, it is exempt from um, uh, VAT. Uh, so if you're saying that now you are taxing 16% uh, on the passenger vehicle, this tax is going to be passed to the consumers, which is going to make uh, traveling very expensive. So those are some of the details that are here that need to be we checked at the same time uh, the care is saying that once um, a decision has been made at their appeal tax appeals tribunal in the past when a decision has been a ruling has been made at the tax appeals tribunal uh, you had uh, an opportunity to appeal at the high at the court at the, at the high court but again this finance bill is proposing that if the you have a matter that has been determined by the tax appeals tribunal and the tax appeal to renewal rules in KRA's favor, uh, the KRA has powers to issue urgency notice even as you appeal, which is again a very dangerous thing because 
you know most of the assessments are regina and i know that some of sometimes kra makes a lot of mistakes uh, it uh, as in terms of uh, even issuing assessments and we haven't had any law to punish kra officers when they issue ridiculous assessment so when the kra is getting powers to actually claim those taxes um, without giving you room to exhaust the legal uh, channels that are av available in law uh, that, that is a bit mischievous and it's also uh, taxpayers need to be aware even in the discussions with the parliament uh, we hope that that is uh, going to be removed from the finance bill before it is ascended to become an act yeah so these are some of the areas that uh, i think is the devil in the details anna uh, thank you, uh, Bossi. So, um, with with that in mind, knowing that KRA has a say, then how does a businessman or a business owner then uh, make sure that they align with the KRA officer so that they're not overcharged? Because uh, I know if they just you send statements, uh, they will just use the statement and decide the kind of pricing. How how? Does a business on how can a business person participate to ensure that then their businesses and the uh, I mean the the invoice that is raised by KRA is within acceptable limits? Oh, the assessment. Uh, okay, one yes. is um, it just so what you're saying is how to manage your tax affairs so that you are not in dispute with the KRA's assessment. Because yes. in Kenya, as I said earlier, that we have what we call a self-assessment system. Uh, tax planning begins even before you spend money. You need to understand uh, what are you spending on and what is your before you receive money and before you spend. So the best tax planning is trying to foresee if I'm like, for instance, building a factory, how do I keep my purchase invoices and what taxes are involved uh, before even I start selling so that you know very well if you're building like a factory for manufacture, there's what you call capital allowances, that investment deductions that you need to keep. So one is very good uh, tax planning even before you undertake certain investments or business tra uh, transactions, uh, sitting with your tax advisor to understand what uh, is taxable, what is not taxable, what expenses are allowable, what uh, tax benefits exist and all that. Trying to be proactive in management of tax affairs. And then number two, I've got, you know, I always say that the challenge in this country is that most businesses don't have tax consultants. Most companies, they would rather start a business, make a lot of mistakes, fall into trouble and invite you at a very later stage when the challenges are almost uh, uh, recoverable. So being proactive in tax planning is very critical in trying to avoid trouble with the care. And then the other issue is record keeping, because you understand that um, when you are under tax assessment with KRA, you have the burden of proof uh, in terms of uh, your expenditures. KRA just make sure that that burden of proof is on you. So you, it is incumbent on any business owner to make sure that records are very well kept so that when KRA raises questions, you can always move to them and give clarity uh, to what is supposed to be done. And then the other issue is proactively responding to KRA queries on your accounts. You realize that even before KRA raises assessment, they will raise queries on your account. They'll say, hey, we have looked at your records, we have understood you have these this, this issues, you respond within 14 days or seven days, failure to which you will issue an assessment. So some taxpayers will not respond in time, maybe because they don't have that kind of advice or they don't know where to begin. Once they don't do that, KRA issues an assessment, and then you have a very big uh, uh, challenge of now trying to disapprove that and give uh, and object. And sometimes KRA is careless enough not even to look at your objection, but just give an objection decision irrespective. Then it makes compliance very expensive. So making sure that you proactively respond to KRA queries as and when they arise. Also reviewing your ITAX ledger. Now, now the, the beauty about it, we have an ITAX ledger that is interactive. You can always open the ITAX ledger, look at what are the exposures you have with regards to your filings, and regularly uh, try to see how do you comply. And also conducting health checks for your business on a regular basis, tax health checks. And then the other issue is uh, just having a a good uh, rapport with KRA, especially when they come with the officer. It's not about running up and down, trying to hide and or, 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 or trying to avoid them. Having a good conversation and just trying to understand where they're coming from and proving your case. That will help to remit the dispute between 
you and KRA and uh, getting unfavorable uh, tax assessments from KRA. Uh, thank you, Bossi. Maybe uh, going back to Regina, there's a question on for, for businesses and rental income. What was the effective debt for housing levy? Regina? Okay, so that one is this year, January 2024. So someone who is doing business and um, uh, the rentals, they can go back from January and uh, redo all of them. I can also see a question there asking, how do you pay for the affordable housing levy yet uh, you you're doing the rental. So when you go to the payment registration in ITAX, uh, you select the income tax, then you're going to see the affordable housing levy. So you don't have to be registered for payee to pay for it. You can go for payment registration and you find it there and then you can pay for it. So those are for the people who don't have pay uh, as an obligation. Okay, and I think the next question then goes uh, from Jaffet is asking, therefore your reading of section four is that a person is both human and non-human into brackets limited company, thus all are subject to housing levy. I think you might be better placed. I, I do not know what section four means. Maybe you can demystify it for us. Oh, I've not read it. Okay, it's uh, okay. It's because of the applicability where they say that uh, we are doing it for employees, and we are coming to do it for the businesses and for the rental property. So I think when when it went back to uh, to to the courts, the inclusion part was. Um, was where the, the now the other businesses and the rental properties came in because ideally it was geared to go to the employees, but the feeling that uh, the, the burden was too heavy for them. So for me, I think the affordable housing levy, uh, what I would have wanted is the more clarity on how everything is happening. Actually, even the introduction of doing it to the um and, and the sensitization of doing it to the rental property came around much. So uh, I think it is still in the baking and in doing uh, it correctly. But what I would urge uh, um, the people who are around and they are doing businesses. So if you have a business, you can pay, you can choose to have employees and you as an employer and do it under employees, you're going to do 1.5% of course, and 1.5%. So it's going to be about 3%. If you're doing it on your sales, which is also very expensive because you're doing it on your gross sales, you can do the 1.5% on your gross sale. If you have a property, do the property separately, 1.5%. So at the moment, that's what I would say. And it, you can also pay for it, even if you don't have the pay obligation. So Regina, can the landlord also pay themselves a salary so that they can pay 1% of their salary instead of the, <laughs> the gross rental income? Oh, I, I, no, it's not applicable. It's not applicable. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's not. You can't. You can't because this is something that is intertwined with your monthly rental income. So you cannot say that I collected 200,000 this month, but I'm paying myself 30,000. So I'm going to pay MRI on this. No. Otherwise, you're going to have tax issues that they're going to be, you, and they're going to be very, very expensive in future. So if you're doing the monthly rental income, that 200 that you recognized there, also recognize it for affordable housing levy. Okay, then there's a question here. One, um, I think it's still on Jaffet, the section four is on the housing levy, and he's asking one, uh, one is based on gross pay and the other is based on turnover. Does that pass the principle of tax equity? Okay. 
Uh, I think so. For me, I think so because uh, I find it very, very extremely expensive, especially if it come to the business owner who is supposed to do the 1.5 percent on their gross sales. So the equity, of course, there's there's a lot. Uh, it's not equitable when we talk about uh, making the tax collection equitable for all. So there are so many uh, areas, but the business owner can be able to judge and say, if I do the 1.5 on my gross sales, uh, what if I do, I, I introduce employees, apply for pay. Of course, when you do employees, if you go the, the route of employees, remember, you have to do the pay as you earn for the employees. And then also the employees, they also come with other benefits, the uh, SHIF, which it was NHIF, the NSSF, the NITA, and then the affordable housing levy. So you can do that calculation and say, uh, what is more, uh, what is what is uh, less uh, expensive for my uh, small business? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tari. And this is to Ronald. Uh, there is a separate abridged return for rental income tax. Has CARE amended this return to include provision of affordable housing levy, or how does a landlord file and pay the affordable housing levy? Um, I believe in terms of uh, affordable, in terms of landlords, uh, maybe let me just talk about also affordable housing levy, especially on landlords. You know, in the the the. the they had revised through the previous finance act we had revised um the monthly rental income especially on residential properties not uh, collecting rent of not more than 15 million to 7.5 percent from 10 percent so i believe by the treasury just um, loading 1.5 percent housing levy on that it's just effectively increasing the the monthly rental income from 7.5 to now nine percent indirectly without communicating to the uh to the to the, without the directly saying indicating so uh, but again i've said in the past that um, it's a, the good thing is with regards to uh monthly rental income it's in it's in now in the in your especially as a as a landlord you can assess whether the monthly rental income makes sense to you if you have more expenses uh than uh, the rental income you can depart from the monthly mm -hmm. rental income and do the the thirty percent regime, especially if you realize that you have an interest, you have expenses that you can recover from your rental income, then that will also give you a leeway to actually recover salary from your rental income and pay the affordable uh, housing levy only on the salary and not on the turnover. If you find that uh, one point five percent of the turnover is too much, so you can decide to depart from the 1.7.5 uh, MRI uh, tax regime and go to the expense regime if you realize that your expenses uh, are far much more than what you are recovering. And I believe this um, uh, can be filed together with your uh, monthly rental income, the, the housing levy uh, in the same return and just, because the most important thing is for the money to be remitted to carry. So if you can file it together with the monthly rental income, I think it will be acceptable. Okay, so someone has asked the the bill 2024, when are these tax payable? I, I believe it's still a bill, so maybe uh, help us understand how we move from the bill to the act. Maybe that yeah. then would answer the question, yeah. Yeah, I think I had explained that uh, once this bill has been debated ex exhaustively in parliament, and uh, maybe the parliament could give some amendments or they might be without amendments. The bill is now forwarded to the president either with amendments or without amendments and the president assent to it if he's satisfied that what the MPs have done is um, appropriate and acceptable to him. If the president is not happy, he may return the bill to parliament for further deliberations with his uh, notes or areas of concern. Uh, last year, the bill was fast tracked. For many years, the bill normally gets late up to uh, uh, August. Uh, sometimes it has gone up to August, July. But last year, the bill was signed almost around 30th June. But you remember, 
uh, that uh, we had got issues on the affordable housing levy and it dragged a bit. But often when the, the taxes are amended through the finance bill, we have two types, the indirect taxes, mostly the VAT, excise duty, because they are levied on transactions, they always come into effect on the like first of July, assuming if it's handed with this month, mostly it will come into effect as and when the bill is uh, enacted uh, into an act. So mostly the indirect taxes, uh, excise duty VAT will be on first July, but any amendments to the, in, the, the direct taxes, that's the income tax, uh, especially the corporation tax, will oftenly come into effect the beginning of January. Most of them are always from January because most of the companies, their financial year is from 1st January to end. So that is how the, the practice has been in the previous uh, period, yeah. Thank you, Ronald. And maybe uh, at this juncture, allow me to uh, bring on board Patrick. Patrick, I know uh, tax matters, we will leave them to Regina, but to the clients at HFC, how do we see taxes impacting uh, the customers and how can we help them navigate these tax? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Anna, I hope I am sufficiently audible. Yes, you uh, are. Thank you. Thank you to our tax experts. Quite insightful, a lot of note taking, a lot of learning. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, there are instances where taxes can be positive in terms of uh, creating extra cash flow to, to businesses. Uh, and so the, the benefits, obvious, they are obvious there. I, I will dwell a bit more on the where the uh, impact of taxes is an increase uh, in the tax payable. Uh, and so the first one, the obvious one is cash flow. Uh, I'll just highlight a few, and then I can speak to how HFC can help and is helping our, our customers to navigate this. Uh, so the first one is obviously cash flow. Uh, you will be required to pay more the, to the government, uh, to KRA, uh, and that is what most of the debate has been around. Uh, but indirectly, it may necessitate you to increase the price of your product. Uh, and if there is a compelling or uh, a compelling uh, 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 supplement or uh, one that can be able to replace your product, uh, customers generally vote with their feet. And then uh, there is uh, going to be obviously an increase in the administrative cost, both, both in terms of compliance, uh, from uh, ensuring that you have uh, ticked all the boxes that are required, uh, uh, and therefore you will have to, in some cases, either institute additional workforce or invest in some form of technology or, and also reach out to experts. Now, these costs um, uh, from the perspective of a business are necessary because the com cost of, com of not complying uh, um, is, is, is way higher. And I like what Ronald said that uh, most of the time, business people uh, just focus on growing the business, uh, take advantage of new opportunities, acquire competitors, uh, and then when the taxman comes knocking is when now there is a whole uh, myriad of complex challenges that are tax related, and it does help to bring them on along earlier. So what are we doing to work with our customers uh, in terms of uh, just helping this? Uh, the first one is just support around uh, cash flow uh, and in terms of your working capital, uh, the immediate need, especially for where you are paying tax on a monthly basis, your bill will go up immediately in the month of July, depending on how the taxes have been uh, approved or passed in parliament and the president assented, assented to them. And so if you do find yourself, you have uh, challenges just to reorganize your business, we have robust working capital solutions that we have in place. Uh, to support you. Uh, the other one that uh, indirectly is helping uh, our clients is our digital uh, transacting capabilities. Um, this is a, this 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 has gone a long way to uh, uh, allow our clients to automate as much as possible of their uh, payment solutions 
uh, how they move money, how they keep records, how they reconcile. And therefore, when you work together with your tax uh, partners and tax consultants or accountants, then you are able to quickly reduce the time it takes to um, comply. Uh, the other area is uh, we are doing these forums uh, that directly give you information and an opportunity uh, for you, our customers, uh, to learn from the experts, to link you up with these experts, uh, so that then you can begin uh, early on in the journey of navigating uh, uh, tax uh, uh, issues uh, uh, that keep on coming up uh, every year, as we have seen in the last couple of years. So Anna, that's what I can highlight uh, on uh, in those two areas that you have raised. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And I think uh, each one of us uh, is speaking some nuggets. Maybe if you have any questions that would like uh, any of the panelists to address, we still have an opportunity to keep chatting uh, the question. So I'll just, uh, uh, this is still to Patrick. Uh, I know there are at sector levels that you've talked about the opportunities um, uh, that are available at HFC in terms of working capital and all that. How, how do the customers take advantage of these opportunities uh, to make sure that they actually um, feel the impact that HF is actually uh, reaching out to the clients uh, with? So uh, thank you, Anna. I, I think as I come to answer that, um, I would like just also to highlight that uh, in every situation, um, what is constant is that there will be change. Uh, the debates last year around this time were largely around housing levy. Uh, this year, it has expanded uh, uh, to other areas of the economy. Um, there is impact in the manufacturing space. There is impact in the in, uh, in the digital space. Uh, may I request uh, you mute, please? Thank you. Yeah. So thank you, thank you for that. There was a bit of background noise. Uh, so I think what I would call out first, Anna, is at an at an overall level, not just to do with the HFC. But when you look at it from uh, the wider economy, where are the places, the money we are all being taxed, where are the places this money is going to? Uh, and uh, we, we pick uh, two key sectors, um, actually three, uh, because uh, there's one also going to be effective from July 1st. Uh, the first one is uh, real estate value chain. Uh, if you look at what the funds that are collected around the housing levy, I think there is a 96 billion allocated to it. Huh? So there is incremental part of the funds that are being uh, collected. They will end up in the real estate sector, largely around the affordable housing space. So whereas this is uh, um, at a contributory level, this is a pain for most of the contributors, for all of us. From a business perspective, it is an opportunity if you are in that space or you, have, you can be able to create a vertical within your business uh, to tap into that. And there are tax breaks around some areas there that uh, businesses can take advantage of, uh, even as you contribute on this other side. The second large area, uh, and as has happened in the past, is in the education space. Uh, so the largest uh, partaker of the taxes contributed is education. Uh, and so we again have very robust offerings uh, for our customers in the education space. So whereas we have seen a lot of debate about the amounts that are being collected from the populace, it is good to look at where is this amount deployed so that then from a business perspective, uh, you can reorganize and restructure your business to be able to take advantage of this. And lastly, which is the, uh, the one that will be coming in, um, but it's separate from the finance bill, it's uh, the social health uh, contributions. Um, uh, around the health space, again, there is a significant amount of money 
uh, that is incremental that will be going to that space. Um, and even the contributions that we are provided, we are being deducted uh, as individuals and uh, for uh, companies, those amounts have gone higher. So when we look at it from HFC perspective now, in terms of what we can uh, add value to our customers, is to say that on these particular three um, sectors, they actually are our focus sectors. They have been for the last uh, four years. Uh, and we have uh, not just working capital lines, but also uh, uh, facilities that help you to tap into uh, the uh, the opportunities that you are a, you are seeing yourself and your company being able to tap into. How do you immediately access this? Uh, the first way is uh, you can log into our website. You can see all the offerings that we have. You can do this from the comfort of your desk. Uh, you can also reach us in any of our branches. Uh, uh, first of all, on the website, you can also uh, request uh, additional information and someone will reach out to you. So you don't need to leave your 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 offices or your business. Uh, the second way is uh, to visit our branches. Uh, we have dedicated relationship managers uh, who will be able to take you through how you can take advantage of this. In one of these areas, we are leading and working uh, with uh, uh, both in with the government, both in terms of policy and also working with our clients in terms of how do you take advantage for the uh, around the policy. Um, uh, incentives that have been put in place, uh, for example, to uh, encourage uh, uh, local uh, uh, production and uh, local artisans to participate in the mega affordable housing projects. So, Anna, that's how I can wrap that up uh, uh, from the perspective of how do we take advantage of the opportunities that are coming up. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Uh, maybe this is to Regina. I, I know I want to take us back. You talked about we talked about e teams, and I'm curious to know: are there any exemptions or special consideration for certain industries or sectors uh, under the e teams? I know um, when e teams was um, made mandatory for small businesses from March, uh, majority have been wondering: do I need to be on e teams? If I'm not on e teams, uh, what happens? Uh, also, are there exemptions? Uh, to uh, for me not to be on ET as a as a small business holder. Okay, so thank you, Anna. Uh, so when ETIMS was introduced, uh, mostly it first was introduced to businesses that were at the at the threshold of VAT. So when your business was at the VAT level, that is where we first uh, because that is a point where. The ETR, the, the, the old ETR was applicable. But during the Finance Act 2023, they decided that all business, there was a circular prior to that, that all businesses should be registered for ETIMS. And uh, of course, there have been so many discussions around the area, and we saw also the president uh, talking about it and trying to exempt the farmers and the small businesses which are not at the threshold of 1 million uh, turnover per year to be exempted from it using ETIMS. But before I come to that point, possibly I can share the difference or some of the, the issues that ETIMS comes in. Uh, when we had the ETR and uh, Ronald has mentioned, there's so many issues, the illegal issues that we were doing not uh, uh, sharing the correct sales, uh, invalid invoices that came to the point where we there was the introduction of the teams. And we bought the new teams machine, but later there was an introduction of the eTeams software. And the difference between the teams, and some of us are still on teams because we bought the machines, the difference between the teams and eTeams is that with eTeams, you have to specify the item that you're selling with the teams it operated the the, the way etr was you was operating the only difference was that it was sending the information to carry on real-time basis but now with etims when you're selling something to 
a customer, you have to specify the item, the description, even the item code, how many quantity, how much. So if you're selling something for 50,000, you have to describe that I'm selling two quantity code, this item multiplied by the quantities, everything. They want to see the whole description. And this also means that eTeams has a stock management system. And also is, is, is uh, to show that even in future, there will be a lot of audits when it also comes to the, our stocks. So the audit will circle around our sales and it will also circle around the stocks. So this is also a caution that I would want to caution uh, the business owners are he who are here because what we used to do or what we some of us do is that when we are purchasing, we purchase very well with items and we get all our purchases very well. But when we come to selling, we don't sell with items, meaning that our purchases are too high, but our sales are too low. But now through the items and the work of the item, they can be able to monitor that whatever you have purchased, you have not sold. So it's either on your stock or you have underdeclared yourself. So for anyone who is operating items, that is something that you really need to show. I give an example. If you're operating a hardware and you get your purchases for a specific item that is cement and you get all your cement purchases invoices. So in the whole year, you bought like 5,000 bags of cement. But when you come to sell, there's no recognition of that sale. So when you recognize, you recognize like 2,000 bags. There's a def deficit of 3,000 bucks, which you have to explain. So items is not just capturing our sales, but it's also capturing our stocks. So that is something that I would want to, you to be aware. So the, the proposal of 1 million turnover is supposed to mostly to, in the agricultural sector, and the small businesses. But I also questioned, because some of this agricultural sector, for instance, something like, um, uh, like, uh, like avocado farmers. So when they are selling their avocado, mostly the, when they want to good prices, they sell to companies that are doing export. But for these companies that are doing export, they want to protect their expenses. Remember, Eatings also has there was also stated that for your purchases and your expenses, they have to be eatings compliant. If they're not eatings compliant, they are going to be deducted. They, they are going to be disallowed. So you have also to protect your purchases and your expenses that they are eatings compliant. So for this farmer who is selling the avocado to this company, and this company want to protect their purchases and expenses, how will they accept that you, we can pick your avocado and you don't have a NITIMS invoice and sell to us? So for me, I think it was a relief to the small business owners, but where are they going to sell their product? Not unless they sell their product to the local people, but if they want to sell their product to this company, that this company which is doing export and they want to protect their purchases, they still have to use items. So possibly that is what I mentioned about that. And uh, also something is that uh, items is also going through a, a, a lot of uh, progression on, uh, on making it work. We also got to a point where we also, when we are filing our returns, the VAT return, there's the outer population of data because of the efficiency of items. So like this month has been, uh, uh, the outer population of data has not been happening. I'm told that today it is, it is working. So there's been uh, areas where items is, sometimes it's not working, sometimes it's working, but I think it's, it's work in progress to just make it efficient. Back to you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Regina. I think that's quite packed. Uh, you really unpacked some of the, the things in regards to eatings. Um, and as you've mentioned, um, there was a need for transition for all businesses onto eatings. Uh, if I am a business and I'm not on eatings, uh, do I expect a knock on my door by a care of 
uh, or it's something that is work in progress. <laughs> I think that's the concern I would have as a small uh, trader. Okay. So, Kerry, remember also uh, two, about two years ago, there were officers that were released that they are supposed to come and knock on our doors and check. First of all, they will be checking on eatings because it was a requirement that every business should be on eatings. So, and also there's a charge that if you don't on be on eating, this is a finance bill 2024 that is uh, giving a penalty of 2 million if they find that you're not uh, registered for eatings and you're not using eatings. But they might not victimize you because now they don't know if you are small, but the, what they'll do, they'll ask you for your records. So they will ask you for your banking, mostly six months, or your sales records, and they're going to determine. So if you're not, if you're at that threshold of one million, uh, then they're going to charge you for it. So, and also for business owner who is small, if you want to sell to a company that is going to demand that items, then you have to register. So for that past for carry knocking on your door and charging you because they have to check on your records first. But if you also want to scale your business and sell your product in an in a company that requires an items invoice, then you have to register for it. Wow. Uh, thank you, uh, Daktari. So this is to Bosi. Uh, I can see we we're almost out of time. Um, please. Give us a nugget that you'd like the participant to take away uh, to from today's conversation. And even as you do that, there's someone who had asked, how do we go about VAT for sole proprietors? When is the business required to register uh, for VAT or uh, TOT? So as you end with your nuggets of the day, maybe you can also address that question. Over to you, Bossi. Yeah, thank you, Anna. So for the... Sole proprietors when they are supposed to register for tax. Uh, one of the beautiful things that happened in this uh, finance bill, and uh, if I send it to will be now into law, is the issue of variation of VAT um, threshold. So initially we had uh, you are supposed to register for VAT when you hit a turn of five million shillings per year, and through the proposals they are now varying that to a turnover of eight million shillings per year. But again, one of the most overlooked uh, issue is also the issue of turnover tax. Uh, you know, in the previous uh, Finance Act, the turnover tax threshold was 50 million shillings. But again, I saw most, very few people actually took advantage of that. Uh, then now, in the previous last year, the turnover tax uh, threshold was lowered to 25 million shillings. So if you're in the informal sector, uh, you are dealing in the business in the informal sector and you want a very easy way to comply with the taxes i will um, uh, and you're not actually supplying mostly to corporates because corporates will demand that you have VAT registered and then you can always do the turnover tax which is only at uh, um three percent or it's just 25 million shillings uh, but then i the, i know this the affordable housing levy of um, uh, 1.5 percent that has been uh, also surcharged on the turnover tax but it's also a very good avenue for those who want to minimize their uh, tax compliance obligations. Uh, I think for my parting shot is that um, taxes are here with us. Uh, it's um, an unnecessary evil. The government needs money, yes, but again, it's not a very interesting thing to comply. You must have heard of this joke that uh, you need to teach your kids how to pay taxes when they are small. Uh, by taking part of their fruit, maybe 30% of their fruit when you give them. So again, it's a habit to be learned. Uh, since it is not going anywhere uh, away and you have visited most countries, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, it's always a good story before you reach there and you realize that uh, the forest is the same. So for people who are looking for sustainable business and generational business, what I will say that you have to just try to see how do you comply uh, to improve on your competitive advantage again for the purpose of sustainability uh, again in terms of compliance you need to get professional advice embrace um, a tax expert who you can work with along with them in your compliance journey so that you don't pay too much you don't overpay tax but you just pay the right amount of taxes yeah so with that you will be able to build a more there are also a lot of benefits 
that are overlooked by most taxpayers in the act. Uh, they, has, they are here, the issues of um, mortgage interest that has now been put for directors, especially if you're earning, um, if you are contributing to um, uh, a mortgage scheme like HF. There are also other benefits like um, a contribution to pension scheme. So you, you need to get a good tax express so that you can do tax planning, which minimize your liabilities at the same time, minimize your exposure and make your business more sustainable. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate HF and the participants for an opportunity to interact with you on this important subject. I look forward to personalized interactions and I will share my email on the chat box for anyone who want to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bonabosi. Uh, those are nuggets we will all be taking away and allow Regina to give us uh, her closing remarks. No, we can't hear you. You're muted. All right, <laughs> sorry. So as Ronald has mentioned that taxes are here to stay with us and uh, the government requires more money to run the government. So what you require as a business owner is to understand the tax obligations that you're supposed to be uh, uh, doing in your business, be tax compliant, uh, ensure compliance uh, for your business, uh, conduct uh, regular health uh, tax health checks and controls. I think this is a point where we do a lot of uh, managerial and controls of our business to make sure that we are uh, uh, we we survive. The business is able to survive, but also grow in the in the future. Uh, so professional advice is very very important. So I'm so happy to be here with you, Anna. Thank you for the opportunity to contribute. Uh, and uh, we shall continue with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Regina. Uh, it was also a pleasure to have you on board. We'll allow Patrick to give his uh, final remarks. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, and thank you to uh, our panelists. Uh, thank you to our Bank MD for enabling us to run this. We thank our participants for coming. Uh, and uh, listening to the experts. Uh, I, I just want to highlight uh, a few things that uh, are takeaways. For me as, a, 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 as a, an employee, as a business man, and what comes to mind is taxes will keep evolving as our country evolves. The debates about taxes that we used to have four years ago and the debates we are having today are very different. Um, and so what is constant is that uh, in this regulatory and macroeconomic environment, there are changes that will keep happening. I think where, how it will become good or bad is really largely how we respond to it, who are our partners, and how we can work together to navigate that. And so we want to highlight and share that HFC is a strong partner in that journey. Uh, we embrace change. Uh, we are looking at this finance bill and awaiting what will be the final one that will go out uh, into the public, the one that will uh, be assented by the president. And then we will look and say, how do we navigate this with our customers so that we come out of the challenges that it will create stronger and we will have grown. So uh, what I would say is that um, the changes that we see in this world of today, they are constant and they happen very fast. And you need a partner who's able to respond to those very quickly. And HFC uh, is your right partner on that. And thank you all for making time to attend uh, this session. Anna, back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, I think what I've picked from you is that uh, uh, the only thing that is constant is change. And as our MD had earlier mentioned, 
that if in this world nothing can be said to be certain except death and and taxes, uh, then what I would leave with you as I invite um, uh, Madam Jerusha, our head of branch business, to just give his um, uh, thanks and appreciate every participant who has been present, is um, a quote by Benjamin Graham. He says, the work of a business is measured not by what has been put into it, but by what can be taken out of it. So we hope um, our clients and businesses out there have been able to get a nugget and a snippet that would assist them in running their day-to-day -day business today, uh, and therefore apply it to better uh, run their businesses. Over to you, Jerusha, and thank you to everyone who joined in. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Anna. My name is Jerusha Igumbo. I'm the GM for Branch Business. And first of all, I actually want to thank Ward for this opportunity, uh, giving us this opportunity today to actually have this very, very informative session. Uh, I would also want to thank our host, our bank MD, Mr. Puta Mugeni, for enabling this. To the panelists, Dr. Regina Kingori, Mr. Ronald Bossi, uh, Patrick Njunge, thank you so much. It has been quite uh, informative. And I would also want to thank all the participants who have joined us today. You've taken your time from your very busy schedules to just join us. And uh, you have been very engaging and asking the questions. And uh, I really hope that this has been a session that you've taken away those nuggets that you really need to, to use to navigate in this environment that we currently have on taxation and our financial environment in this country. So with that, I would want to close and uh, basically thank you for joining and wish you a very, very good day today. Thank you.